going to mention this again in a moment, but I'm just letting everybody know that we are recording this presentation, this, um, this meeting. Um, it helps us to keep a record and provide that record to others who uh, may want to review, may want to review the record. So um, just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware that uh, the meeting is being recorded. While we're waiting, good morning, everyone. This is Mary Beth Chubb with DEP. If everyone um, who's at a computer, if they could sign in um, with your name, email, and affiliation in the chat, it's going to serve as our sign in sheet today. To you directly, Mary Beth, or uh, just a general chat? Just a general chat would be fine. Thank you. All right. I don't see any other folks um waiting to be admitted we're up to 41 people now um unless i hear any objections from my uh, colleagues here at dep i think we can get get started and try to be respectful of people's time and keep us on track on the agenda okay we're good to go Yes, I think we can get started. All right. Everybody's on mute. <laughs> um, excellent. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Leldon Langley. I am the director of the Division of Watershed Management at MassDEP. Uh, we are glad to welcome you of the uh, Title V and Groundwater <laughs> Program Stakeholder Group. Um, Sorry, Excuse me, this yet. is Paul Yorkus. Could you ask folks to mute themselves so we're not hearing them keyboarding? Yes, thank you. Um, getting to some instructions now about the um, Zoom call. The call is being recorded. Um, this allows us to keep a record of it and provide that record um, to others who may be interested in the proceedings as well as uh, be able to uh, you know, easily keep track of what people's uh, comments are and what they have to say. Um, if you're on the computer, please sign in by putting your name, email, and affiliation in the chat um, and sending that to everyone. We'll keep a record of that as well. If you're on the phone, please mail your, um, your name and contact information and your affiliation to Mary Beth Chubb. Um, that is Mary Beth, M-A-R-Y-B-E-T-H dot Chubb, C-H-U-B-B, at mass.gov. Um, if folks could please put their, uh, themselves on mute, unless you are speaking, that would be great and help keep down on um, feedback and just general noise. Um, so we're gonna um, go through the agenda in just a moment, uh, but first I wanted to just provide you with some introductions of the DEP staff who are on the call. Um, Gary Moran is here. He's our Deputy Commissioner um, for Operations at MassDEP. Kathy Baskin is the Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Water Resources at MassDEP. Deirdre Desmond is an attorney from our Office of General Counsel. Uh, Brian Dudley is located in our Southeast Regional Office and is a Section Chief of the Cape District. J 
John Murphy is here. He is our um, Title V operator, I'm sorry, he is our um, wastewater treatment plant operator, uh, group uh, manager and, and uh, certifier of wastewater treatment plant operators. Claire Golden has joined us from the Northeast Regional Office of our Title V section. Dave Boyer has also joined us from the Central Regional Office Title V section. Did I miss any DEP folks? If I did, please um, unmute yourselves and, and uh, let us know that you're there. Uh, Brett Rowe, Southeast Office. Hi, Brett, good morning. Matt Sokop, Western Regional Office. Good morning, Matt. Okay, I'm just selecting my, um, trying to locate the agenda here and then, um, can go through the, um, sorry, locating the presentation in a screen share. Give me one moment. All right, can folks see the slideshow now? Yep, it's up on my computer. Okay. And trying to get to the from beginnings. There we go, okay. All right, so again, it's the um, Executive Order 562 Regulatory Review Stakeholder Group for Title V and Groundwater Discharge uh, Permit Programs at MassDEP. This is our October 8th, 2020 Zoom call. Um, we have, uh, this is now a shot of the agenda. Um, I'm going to turn it over in a moment to Mary Beth Chubb, um, who is section chief for our Title V and groundwater section in the Boston office, and let her talk a bit about the Executive Order 562 scope and principles. And then from there, we will proceed into different um, presentations, the first being the nitrogen sensitive area subcommittee update. That committee met on September 3rd, and we'd like to report out what was done in that, in that work group. Then we'll talk about moldering privies, um, the local upgrade approval guidance document that has been prepared, and um, multi-residence occupancy data study. On that study, we will have um, a presentation from the UMass Donahue Institute. And then we will have a groundwater separation virus study, um, explain the scope of work, and allow our colleague at um, the Mass Test Center uh, present to present that material. And then we'll have a brief wrap up. We are hoping to have some time for, we will have time for questions and answers. Um, and uh, if there's anything else that people need to let us know, please feel free to submit your comments or questions in the chat function. And we'll try to get, we'll get to those um, questions as they come up in chat um, at opportune times during the, each of the presentations. And then, um, you know, if there's anything left after that, we will, you can email us any additional questions that you may have. Um, unless I've missed anything, Mary Beth, I think I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great, thanks, Weldon. Um, so as a brief refresher for the stakeholder group, um, and for those who may have recently joined the stakeholder group, uh, I'll just go over briefly how we got here. Back in 2015, um, there was an executive order 562 um, requiring DEP to review its regulations and look for ways to improve uh, efficiencies in those regulations and streamline and eliminate duplicity. Um, the principles that were established for that process were 
that there could be no weakening of environmental protections, that we would not consider regulatory changes that would require either increases in Mass DEP staff or the transference of Mass DEP responsibilities to municipalities. And also that we would not prioritize statutory changes or changes to federal responsibilities. So on the next slide, you'll see how we formed our group in 20, uh, from that order in 2015, DEP received 12 comments that pertain specifically to the Title V regulations and the groundwater discharge permit program regulations. And so in order to address these 12 comments in detail, in 2017, we formed the Title V groundwater discharge regulatory revision stakeholder group. Um, we have had three meetings of the main group two in 2017 and one in 2018, and address six of the 12 comments during that time. So in this meeting, we'll be updating on you on what we've been doing in 2019 and addressing four of the remaining comments. So let's begin with our first comment, which concerns nitrogen sensitive areas. The comment that was submitted um, under EO 562 stated, DEP is currently authorized under Title V to identify nitrogen sensitive areas. Designation of these areas requires adoption through a change to Title V regulations and the Massachusetts Surface Water Quality Standards at 314 CMR4. Current regulations limit nitrogen sensitive areas to 440 gallons per day per acre. Allow DEP to designate NSAs without the need for regulatory changes to Title V and the surface water quality standards. For future designated NSAs, consider additional requirements for enhanced treatment to address nitrogen. As Lilden mentioned, we formed a subcommittee to delve into this comment and discuss it. And that subcommittee met last month on September 3rd. So now I'll turn it over to Gary Moran who can give us an update on this topic. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I just had some mic problems earlier. So, um, uh, yeah, at the subcommittee did have its first meeting on um, uh, September 3rd. Um, you know, a number of issues were discussed about the, the current regulation, some potential limitations with the current regulation, um, as, as well as uh, areas including um, the definition of an NSA, uh, how are we going to define it down to what level of abatement, sub-abatement, uh, how DEP will in fact determine that uh, the area meets the threshold of a, to, to automatically be considered a nitrogen sensitive area, whether we look at uh, having a TMDL in place, um, the mass estuaries report uh, could be sufficient, uh, the 303D listing, really what, what level of information would be required to make that designation uh, also looked at once the, what the actual requirements are once an area is designated an NSA. Um, right now, there are the loading restrictions for NSAs, uh, the 440 gallons per day, looking at whether there should be other type of um, requirements, uh, something like requiring enhanced nitrogen uh, removal of this in the septic system, um, you know, best available control technology, something other than just that the current loading restriction. Um, and uh, we talked uh, a bit about if there is an alternative compliance pathway. Once an area is an NSA, is there, if a community is moving forward potentially with a plan that would meet the water quality goals, would we need to uh, implement the enhanced requirements for the Title V systems? Or if they are, have an approved plan in place and they're making progress to that, achieve that plan, whether that'd be sufficient at that point because we do recognize ultimately for a lot of the areas we're concerned about that are impacted by nitrogen, uh, just enhanced requirements for Title V systems won't necessarily achieve the water quality goals. We'd rather have communities moving forward with comprehensive plans that use a range of options that uh, would actually meet the water quality goal. Um, and uh, so then there was a uh, you know, discussion about what that, that uh, alternative plan, what form that would have to be in. Uh, we currently have comprehensive wastewater management plans that we, we approve more of an administrative function. Should there be something more um, 
along the permitting side, we, we recently started issuing watershed permits. We have, we issued one down on the Cape uh, for the Pleasant uh, Bay area. Uh, and then on top of that, we need to talk about the uh, implementation schedule for the new requirements. At what point would these requirements be uh, effective, both in terms of the requirements going into place, but then, um, you know, would we be looking at uh, similar Title V, a time of transfer, new construction, or would there be any areas where we would want to see um, you know, upgrades uh, sooner, even with existing systems? So those were some of the, uh, the issues that were uh, discussed at that meeting. I don't know, Mary Beth, can you forward the slides? I can do that, Gary. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Okay, so I think it's the next slide, actually. Okay. So uh, the next steps, uh, uh, we, in addition to the meeting, we've received a fair amount of comment and uh, input following the meeting from the, the subcommittee stakeholders. Um, we're gonna be, we're still reviewing that information to determine uh, if there is, based on that, there is a policy or regulatory language we could draft. Uh, we would then send that back out to the subcommittee for consideration, additional feedback. Uh, we would reconvene the subcommittee for an, an, another meeting to discuss that feedback. And then um, based on that, we would uh, start internal deliberations. We hope to have, we're looking at a schedule where we potentially would have the feedback from the subcommittee by the end of the year, and we'd be in a position to uh, start internal review. Uh, obviously, uh, these type of changes would be significant changes to Title V. So uh, once we have uh, basically the feedback and we've come up with some proposals, we'd work through um, you know, the administration to, uh, to, to you know, further uh, discuss those. Um, I should note, um, you know, obviously the discussion about some of the, the provisions of Title V and um, particularly in relation to Cape Cod, uh, that's taken on some uh, increased attention over the past week. Uh, the Conservation Law, Law Foundation filed a notice of intent uh, to sue um, Town of Mashpee, Town of Barnstable and uh, the Mass DEP uh, based on uh, you know, claims that we are failing to protect uh, water quality through uh, what they claim is um, the not following the provisions of Title V. Uh, putting aside the merits of the suit, obviously this focuses a lot more attention on you know uh, Title V and how it does impact water quality in those areas. So uh, on on that side, we're obviously in discussions how we deal with that. But I just think it it really uh, creates even more attention to this particular discussion and, uh, and emphasizes the need for us to, you know, uh, consider what is, might be appropriate changes. So I think the next slide is if there's any questions on that. Great, so if people can put their questions into the chat and we can read them out loud in case we do have participants on the phone. <clears throat> And if you're typing but don't have, you know, your, your, your question up yet, you can just unmute, let us know that you're typing and we'll wait for that. Otherwise, we'll give it another minute and then we can move to the next topic if there are no questions. Okay. All right. Last call for questions. <laughs> All right, Mary Beth, then I'm going to um, advance a slide for your next topic. Yep. So our next topic is about moldering privies. Um, Sorry about that. Hang on. That's okay. We'll go back to that one anyway. So we got it. Um, that's fine. You can advance to the comment. Other way. Apparently. There we are, sorry about that. Okay. We do have one question going back to NSAs from Paul Yorkis. Just type in, is one of the options being considered the establishment of a policy that requires the pumping of systems every two years in NSAs? I don't know that that was one. That 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 was one. Yeah. Oh, what was that, Jackie? <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
I don't recall that being discussed in the subcommittee meeting. Gary, I don't know if you. I, I, don't, I don't think I'd heard in subcommittee, it's an interesting comment just in that to the degree the NSAs are gonna rely on uh, upgrades to uh, enhanced systems. Um, never mind traditional uh, systems uh, ensuring they're pumped out properly, but IA systems also carry certain operational requirements in order for them to, to be effective. So uh, that's something we'll have to consider is how you ensure that whatever the system is, is operating uh, properly. Um, and there has been discussions outside of the NSA discussion about different ways that that could be done either by communities or regional entities if, if they were able to help deal with some of those um, operational requirements that traditionally fall on the, uh, the septic system owners just to ensure they are, they are working. Okay, great. Thank you, Gary. All right, so moving on to Mulder and Privies. This comment was submitted to us by the Appalachian Mountain Club. Um, and I'd just like to take a moment to ask if Kristen Sykes and Heather Klish have joined us today, if they could just unmute and say hello. Heather is here. Hello. Hi, good morning. Uh, Kristen Sykes is here as well, thank you. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Heather. Thanks for being here. So AMC submitted this comment that the current Title V regulations do not include provisions for backcountry sanitation for campsites restricted to tent camping and backpackers. Current regulations only include approvals for composting toilets for homes, commercial or public facilities, and plumbing approvals. And in our conversations with the stakeholder group, it was also pointed out that local health agents were seeking guidance on how they could approve these systems. So what is a Mulder and Privy, you might ask? We go to the next slide. So Mulder and Privy was designed, Mulder and Privies were designed and approved by the US Forestry Service. They are already utilized in Green and White Mountain National Forests and along the Appalachian Trail. They are described in detail in the Appalachian Trail Conservancy's Backcountry Sanitation Manual. And Lalden, if you can go back to the pictures of the Muldering Privies. So you can see, so it's an outhouse sitting on top of a bin or a crib. The crib is um, aerated, it's typically lined with mesh to prevent um, animals from getting in there. Um, duff is added to the waste and the bin, as the bin fills up, typically it's a two bin system depending on trail usage. And when one bin is full, the outhouse portion can slide over to the empty bin, allowing the full bin to compost over time. Okay, so if we can go back to um, the later slide, and the next one. So where could you use these systems? So I'm these sorry. systems were designed for locations that are not accessible by vehicles, referred to as hike-in, pile-in only campsites. These locations don't have plumbed water available. They would not be able to accommodate a Title V system. Composting toilets are not practical for use at these sites. And essentially, because of their remote and inaccessible location, the goal of full compliance with Title V is both physically impossible and economically infeasible. So we looked at how we could um, offer guidance on approving these systems. And in the next slide, we speak to the local upgrade approval. So local approving authorities have the ability under Title V now to do what's called a local upgrade approval. The goal of the local upgrade approval is to maximize protection of public health, safety, and welfare when you're upgrading an existing system. So we've taken the local upgrade approval and we put together a guidance working with AMC for where these sites could be used and what criteria would be applied um, for the local approving authority to utilize in granting a local upgrade approval. So in the next slide, some of the criteria in the guidance 
local approving authorities may allow the use of moldering privies at existing hiking paddling only sites to upgrade sites that have non-conforming systems such as a pit privy or cat holes. The siting and construction specifications for moldering privies is detailed in section eight of the ATC backcountry sanitation manual. Um, the setback distances for the siting of the moldering privy should comply with the provisions of Title V at 15.211.1 for soil absorption systems. Next slide, please. The siting should also ensure that there is four feet of separation between the bottom of the privy crib and the high groundwater elevation at the site. The size of the crib and the number of cribs uh, will be determined at the approval and should provide sufficient storage to accommodate trail use. Um, AMC typically um, keeps track of the number of users per season and this information will allow them to size these units. The guidance does, um, one of the criteria is that there be a minimum of two cribs but additional cribs can be added um, should usage increase, which still allows the solids to compost and have the time they need to thoroughly compost. When the composted solids um, are thoroughly composted, they can be disposed of. Under Title V, they're allowed to be buried, but other methods can be approved by the local approving authority at the time of the moldering privy um, being installed at the site. And also we have a criteria, although these are low maintenance systems, which makes them very useful for the remote locations, um, there is some maintenance and the trail management company will be the maintainers of the system and there should be signage um, for the campers for the proper utilization, the addition of adding dump to the waste um, to promote that. So the next slide, we have developed a document with all of these criteria spelled out and how the local upgrade approval can be utilized for these instances. That guidance will be posted um, at this link and I will email that link out to the group. We will also be sharing that link with um, Florida Health organizations such as MHOA, MMA, uh, MIHA, YAWA, so we'll get the word out um, and it will be available, as I said, on our website and will be emailed um, that link. So does anyone have any questions or does Chris, do Kristen or Heather wish to add anything that I may have missed concerning the mold drink use? Kristen, I don't have anything. Kristen, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Um. Mostly, I just would like to um, add my great thanks to Mary Beth and Leldon and others from DEP. Um, it's been a, a number of years in working to make this happen um, and just really appreciate the time and the thoughtfulness and to say that this is really going to assist uh, folks getting into the outdoors and having a great experience. And, um, and I have expressed to Mary Beth that, you know, we'd like to further work with DEP in the future on uh, getting approval for these moldering privies at new campsites, knowing that this is for existing, um, and just really appreciative of all the, the thoughtfulness and work to get this done. Thanks, Thank you. Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. Mary Beth, you also had a question in the, um, in the chat function that says, may we have a copy of the presentation? So I was wondering, are you, um, we can certainly provide the presentation were you planning to um, distribute that to the stakeholder group via email or, or were we thinking of posting that to our website? So the presentation can be posted and I will send that link out to the email. Uh, I in the email to the stakeholder group following the um, presentation and essentially on the Title V regulatory page on mass.gov, there is a heading for a stakeholder group um, and that's where the presentation will be that you see today will be um, posted there following the meeting. So those links will be sent out to everyone. And you'll Does be, anyone you, have to? The, the, you'll, the link will be live by the time they get that notice, right? 
it'll, it'll probably just take us a few hours um, to get it posted to our website. Correct. Yeah, great. Okay, are there any other questions on Mulder and Privies? All right, shall we move forward? Um, yes, we can go on to the next topic. Okay, so the next topic, um, the comment that we received concerned Title V design flows um, for residences. The comment submitted was that daily flow rates are incomplete and outdated for current uses and plumbing devices. Flows need to be reviewed and revised. Resurrect committee from five years ago to complete their work. Make revisions to 15.203 sewage flow design criteria and 15.416 school variances, including multifamily and single family homes. This will reduce the high cost of septic systems and the infiltration and inflow requirements on commercial and multifamily projects in the MWRA service area. So on the next slide, we discuss, we had previous meetings on this comment, and as you can see, there is a lot, um, a lot involved in this comment. And the previous discussions focused this topic on the residential flows and specifically on multi-resident flows. The suggestion was that the flow rate for multi-residences at a certain number of bedrooms would lessen, the variations would lessen, and therefore the overall flow um, would be less than a single family home flow. The Massachusetts um, design flow for residences is 110 gallons per day per bedroom. So as the group discussed this and narrowed the topic down to looking at the flow rate specific to multi-residential units, we also realized that it was very difficult to find information that would assist in analyzing this um, and looking into it. Previous analyses that had been done um, were limited by the number of facilities that could be looked at and lacked occupation data, occup occupancy data. Um, and we felt that occupancy data was an important factor to consider in looking at this. So in 2019, MassDEP contracted with the UMass Donahue Institute and their Economic and Public Policy Research Group to investigate what information was available that could provide information to us on this comment and allow us to analyze it and investigate it. And so I'd like to turn it over and introduce Branner Stewart and Abigail Reese, Abigail Race from the UMass group, who will now present on their findings on this topic. Thanks very much, Mary Beth. Um, I think Branner's gonna start us off, but I'm gonna share my screen. So I'm not sure if I can do that until like, Weldon might be the one sharing. Yeah, Abby, I can either run through the presentation for you. I've got it up or I can um, uh, turn it over to you. Do you have a preference? Um, mm. Nope, no, no preference. As long as you don't mind clicking through our slides. Uh, nope, hang on a second. I'm just looking for the new, for that screen. And I have it up too, if you want me to just- Oh, okay. Let me then just see if I can share with you. Okay. All right, I can share my screen now. Yeah, and I'll give you permission. So that should allow you to share now. Okay, great. Can people see it? Yes. And then I will just... All right, Brainer, do you want to get us going? Yeah. You can do um, our I'm introduction. Sorry people... Sure. Um, I'm sorry that, well, that my laptop's camera doesn't work. So that has been you know, both a blessing and a curse during this <laughs> COVID time. And I will be getting a 
a new laptop fairly soon, so people will be able to see me. But um, yeah, I'm um, Brainer Stewart. I'm a senior research manager with the UMass Donahue Institute. And um, yeah, Abby Royce and I have been working with DEP since I think January or February, looking at um, at the um, wastewater flow rates and um, for multi well actually not the rates but analyzing um, the um, multi-residential buildings in Massachusetts and their demographics and how this pertains to um, to the specified um, flow rates um, in the state so um, so just to, yeah, to begin you know the, the objectives are to review the sewage flow design criteria for larger multi-residential systems to determine whether design flow should be decreased at, at a certain number of bedrooms and to evaluate the design flows of, and Abby Royce will be talking about this, um, looking at the design flows for other states to determine the best practices and deviations from the um, conventional gallons per day. And then um, we do a fairly a very detailed um, demographic analysis, looking at um, multi-residential buildings and basically um, residential buildings of all sizes, from single-family homes on up to multi-residential buildings with 50-plus um, um, units. Go ahead. And so, um, yeah, Abby's going to start us off with um, a state-by-state -state comparison. And, um, and I, I just want to emphasize too that um, the water flow assumption that we're looking at is the um, 55 gallons per person um, wastewater flow um, capacity with the assumption that, um, that veterans and and residences have an average occupancy of two people. So that basically translates to a 110 gallon um, um, flow rate per bedroom in Massachusetts based on the assumption of a two person occupancy. All right. Thanks, Branner. Um, and before we start our quantitative analysis of occupancy trends um, in the state of Massachusetts. Like Brenner said, we wanted to get a sense of how other states design their wastewater flow rates. So this graph was, um, shows 17 states that we researched and their gallons per day per bedroom for multi-residential buildings. And as Mary Beth mentioned, we, we really wanted to drive home in, in this graph that Massachusetts has one of the lowest rates in the country. Um, and while the Commonwealth utilizes two people per bedroom, this assumption of two people per bedroom, as most other states do, we have a lower gallon per day per person requirement. Um, so as you can see, our, our gallons per day per bedroom results in about 40 GBD lower than most states that we saw. So the 150 mark here that you're seeing. Um, another thing we investigated too was a pivotal report in 2002 that the EPA released on wastewater treatment systems. Um, and in it, they, lead, they laid out guidelines for state agencies to design or model their wastewater flow criteria on. Um, and similar to our research, they, um, they used census data to guide this design flow criteria. So they investigated the number, average number of people per bedroom and found that 34 out of 50 states um, were actually using that two people per bedroom assumption. Um, and it resulted in a flow rate of around 75 to 100 gallons per person per day. So higher than Massachusetts's rate. Um, and that resulted in 150 to 200 per bedroom per day. Um, and they also found an interesting finding that residential occupancy typically ranges from one to 1.5 persons per bedroom, which is in line with our findings that Branner will discuss next. Um, and even though it's a conservative estimate to then um, set it at two people per bedroom, this is really a best practice for most states um, to assume the maximum occupancy of two persons per bedroom and add a safety factor. Um, and while it's uncommon, we did find that some states deviate from this conventional model. Here we've just highlighted a, a few. So New York, Minnesota, and Texas, they all sort of take the EPA guidelines and adapt them. So a lot of them still assume two people per bedroom, 
But for New York, for instance, they vary that based on the age of plumbing fixtures. So they increase the flow rates for buildings with pre-1994 plumbing fixtures. So they have the same rate as Massachusetts for post-1994 plumbing fixtures, so 110 gallons per day. But for pre-1994, that increases to 130. And then pre-1980, it increases to 150. Um, and they also use metered water flow data from existing structures to help guide that um, design flow criteria. And next, Minnesota also takes an alternative approach, but a little bit different. They, they classify homes based on their size, so square footage, um, and the number of water using devices in, in the units. So they still assume that two person per um, bedroom occupancy, um, but that varies, that assumption varies based on the classification of the dwelling. So they have one through four classifications with lowest to highest per day usage. And then finally, Texas assumes around 75 to 100 gallons per person per day. So exactly the same as the EPA's guidelines. Um, and they don't adjust based on plumbing fixtures or the size of the structure, but they do um, vary that uh, gallons per person per day based on cr specific criteria to the development. So if it's a development that serves families with children, they'll increase the, the flow rate. And if it's retirement communities, it's vice versa. Um, and an interesting finding there too that we got from the Texas Water Quality Division is that flow rates are actually becoming a secondary consideration to the state of Texas with a lot more consideration being given to the strength of waste being treated. So that was, that was a, another interesting finding that we found in doing this kind of best practices scan. Um, so next I'll, I'll pass it back to Branner who's gonna go over our, our data scan. And I can click the slides for you Branner if you just let me know when you're, when you're ready. Oh, sure. Thank you, Abby. Um, and thanks for that explanation concerning the um, water flow rates in the other states. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that th the assumption for um, the design flows is, a, uh, is based on a two-person occupancy per bedroom. And so our next set of slides, in our next set of slides, we're going to take a, a deep look at the um, occupancy patterns for different types of housing. And as I've also mentioned before, so we range in, in terms of um, the, the size of housing from single families all the way up to, to um, multi-residential buildings of 50 or more people. And the idea behind this is to actually dig into the demographics that is available through the US Census Bureau to see how many people per bedroom that we actually see in different types of, of residents. Or, or buildings. So, um, yeah, so this first one is the most broad, and it's showing the um, average number of people per bedroom by building type. And it starts with um, single family, and on the left, which is um, 0 0.87 um, um, people per bedroom. And then it rises up to 1.2 for multi residential buildings of um, 20 to 49 units and then takes a very slight um, decline for multi-residential buildings of, of 50 or more. So, so you can see that um, as building size increases with, in terms of number of units, um, bedroom occupancy also rises. And, um, and, and also, by the way, in terms of looking at the larger multi-residential buildings, about 96% of the units in them are two bedrooms or less. There's only a very, very small number of multi-residential buildings in the state that have three or more bedrooms. Next slide, Abby. And um, yeah, the previous slide was looking at the averages in terms of um, different types of housing, in terms of how many people there are per bedroom. And this looks at the more of the um, of the actual um, numbers there for um, for bedroom occupancy for 20 for multi-residential buildings of 20 or more units. And what's kind of um, interesting about it is that um, you know, overwhelmingly the the occupancy is um, is one person per bedroom or lower, but um, 10 to 20% of the um, of these of 
multi-residential buildings of 20 or more units do have two people or more um, per, per bedroom. Abby, do you want to add anything to that? Or? No, I think you covered it well. Okay, I just want to make sure. I, mean, just, I know that you did this histogram, which looks good. All right, next slide. Okay, and yeah, not surprisingly, um, when you see when households have the presence of children, the average number of people per bedroom rises. And again, we can see a similar trend in terms of building size, starting with single family on the left, that with the presence of children, the average um, occupancy per bedroom is 1.2, and then it starts to rise um, fairly dramatically as the um, number of units in the building increases. And so as you can see on the right, um, when there is a presence of children, the average number of people per bedroom is about 1.9 for 20 to 49 um, multi-residential buildings, and it's 1.82 for multi-residential buildings of 50 or, or more units. Next slide. And, um, and we did, we did, we compared um, occupancy for, for owner led households as well as um, renter occupied households. And um, again, the trend is you know, very similar where um, occupancy rises with them. Um, with the building size and the number of units within within the building, and um, yeah, and and it rises both for um, owner occupied as well as well as renter, but the, the trend is much more visible in terms of of the renter um, occupied households with more people per bedroom in the larger sized buildings. And um, yeah, similar, similarly, um, um, this, is a, this slide right here is based on income levels of the households. And, and um, again, regardless of the income levels, that the um, number of um, occupants per bedroom, again, goes up while as the building size um, increases. And kind of interestingly, um, the higher income Households tend to have more people per bedroom, and the, one of the reasons for that is um, if you have a couple or or most of these units are are going to be um, two bedrooms or smaller, and if you have in a you know, like a double income couple or partners within a um, in a, in a household, then their income increases and that kind of explains why as income rises so does the number of people um, the occupancy per bedroom while the lower income households are more likely to be a single person so have a single person occupancy and thus a, a lower level of income next slide Abby. and yeah again um, this slide shows what occupancy per bedroom is for when a home or a household or, or, or when the building was built for single families all the way up to multi-residential buildings of 50 or more. And again, there's a, a rise in the average number of people per bedroom with the larger size building. And at the very end, you can see that there's um, 1.22 um, people per bedroom in large buildings of 50 or more units in um, for buildings built after 2010. And um, so it shows that in some of the newer buildings, um, we're getting a little bit higher um, um, occupancy levels than some of the, the older structures in Massachusetts. Next slide. And, um, and the, this slide shows the no, average number of people per bedroom 
um, based and of course you know by building size and um, and this one shows what it is for people who are linguistically isolated, basically um, um, having no people within the household who can speak English adequately. And we've um, and again we see the the rise in the number of people per bedroom as the um, building size increases. Um, the UMass Donahue Institute's been doing um, a lot of work you know, with with COVID, and um, and it's also you know clear that you know having you know, more people you know within or or higher occupancy um, per yeah you know, per bedroom is also kind of a way that you know COVID carries and that and we're seeing that especially in um, in cities like you know Chelsea and Lawrence and Lynn, where there's a high proclivity towards um, towards a large foreign-born population. Happy next slide. And this this one shows um, the average number of people per bedroom by region in Massachusetts, and this is for all housing types, not just um, um, multi-family or multi-residential buildings, but um, as you move closer to the urban core in the state, the average number of people per bedroom rises. So, and that would be both for all building types. And so, um, yeah, not surprisingly, um, yeah, the, the center city um, from um, the Boston core um, has the, the highest occupancy levels per bedroom. Slide. And so, um, so uh, I'm not going to go over all these um, points here because I just talked about them. But, but I think one of the main findings is, is definitely, you know, that as building size increases and the and the number of units are um, within a building becomes larger, we're also seeing um, bedroom occupancy rise and and with that um, and based on the census data and our, our deep dive into the demographics and looking and looking at um, bedroom occupancy for different building types um, we see that mass DEP's two person per bedroom assumption maintains its integrity when applied to large multi residential buildings. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Brenner and Abby, for that presentation. Um, so we'd like to open it up to um, any questions that you may have. Um, based on the findings of um, the UMass Donahue Institute and what they just presented to the group, um, DEP agrees with the conclusion and feels that the 110 gallon per day per bedroom um, flow is appropriate for multi-residential units. And there was an indication in the research um, to suggest otherwise. So the decision by DEP is that we will not be doing any further evaluation on this comment concerning changes to um, multi-residential flows. So I see we have a question. Jeff Brem has asked, was this study based on 10 year old figures 2000 census? No, we were using data from the American Community Survey um, PUMS, so the public use micro data sample um, from 2014 to 2018. So it's a it's a five year estimate and it's a sample of a sample. And it's the only way that you can cross households and individuals. So we can actually see people per, per bedroom in a household. So we, we can't actually use the normal census product of the ACS. We have to use a sample of that sample. But it's the most recent, it's the most current um, data. Thanks, Abby. So Tamara, do you want to um, unmute and say your comment before? I hope you haven't hopped off yet. 
Sure, yeah, sorry, I have an 11 o'clock, but basically yeah. I just wanna really commend Mass DEP and the UMass Donahue Institute for this excellent research. Obviously, you spent a great deal of time and, and really you know, dug into this data and it's something we didn't have before, we now do. So Nayap, who was behind this uh, request, very much supports DEP's decision. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Steve Davis. I'm also with NAOP, and as Mary Beth and Weldon know, I was the original skunk at this picnic looking at data from large multifamily. I have one question, Brenner and Abby. I think you did a beautiful job. It is quite impressive, and I have no quibble with it. But one of the things that I detected in my original analyses of about 20 or 30 um, large multifamilies was that the flow tends to be much more stable. The difference between average and max is much smaller. Um, was that taken account of in any way or is that a topic for another time? I think for, for us that would be a topic for another time. Um, So yeah. I, I will say in our report, we did, we did look into the max um, for each of our, our demographic indicators. And we also looked at the 80th and 90th percentiles. So that can be found in the appendix of our report, though we didn't investigate it much. We were mostly focused on the average. Um, hopefully that somewhat answers your question, but it wasn't, it wasn't a focus. Right, in the full report and the presentation, will be posted uh, and I will email everyone the link again at the end of um, after this meeting and once we get all the information posted on the website. And so I could just ask you to mute, <laughs> please, <laughs> if you don't have any further questions. <laughs> We've addressed them sufficiently. Um, so Scott Horsley said, I'm guessing that our new COVID world is increasing residential flows per bedroom, and some of this may stay with us post COVID. I support Mass DEP position to maintain 110 gallons per bedroom. So, thank you, Scott. Well, that brings up the whole question too, during, during COVID and perhaps you know, post COVID too, if we start seeing um, you know, a wave of evictions, which we fear, then we could see people really doubling and tripling up in a, in a way um, with other family members, as well as non-family members, and, um, because they just don't have the, um, the income levels to be able to have, be living in their, their own apartment or home. Yes, and, uh, I'm sure that, yeah, valid points. All right, are there any other questions or comments from anyone in the group? I don't think we have anyone who's on the phone, but I'm not sure. Um, but if you are on the phone and wish to comment or ask a question, you can unmute and do so. Okay, well, I would like to extend DEP's thanks to the UMass group, to Dana Henry, Abby Race, and Brenner Stewart for their work on this project and for the presentation that they just gave everyone. Thank you very much. Thank right, you. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Have thanks a good Mary day. Beth and everybody on the DEP team. Appreciate it, Abby and, and Brenner. All right. Right. Scanning to make sure we didn't miss anyone's comments or questions. I don't think so. Okay. Um, so if we can go back to our presentation. Well, then we have one more um, comment that we're going to cover today. 
And this one has to do with groundwater separation and virus removal. Meredith? Yes. May I ask one parting question? Uh, yes. The current regulations allow in certain instances, such as converting schools and um, some conversions of residential units, to use historic flow data to overcome the 110 gallons a day. Do you intend to leave that provision in place? Because we are not changing the provisions of Title V, but the residences are included in that provision. Okay, Brian or Dave, you want to just double check my work there? <laughs> so long as you're not changing the existing. We're not measures. changing the existing. No, we are not changing the yep. existing requirement. Nope. That, that's, that was my only remnant question, and I will now mute myself and listen to the finale. Thank you very kindly, Leldon, Mary Beth, and the Donahue Institute. Thank Welcome. You, Thank you, Steve. Okay, so our next topic concerns groundwater separation. And the comment we received was there is underutilization of IA technologies for new construction that provide for enhanced effluent treatment. There is a significant fiscal and environmental cost to constructing mounded or filled systems. Allowing a reduction in groundwater offsets for new construction similar to repairs when using alternative technology will provide enhanced effluent secondary benefits. So on the next slide, just to go over what this um, comment is referring to, is currently under Title V, um, it requires a four to five foot separation from the bottom of the soil absorption system to the high level ground, seasonal high level groundwater. Um, and that can be reduced currently in Title V for remedial situations, upgrade situations, utilizing IA technologies. This comment was questioning why Massachusetts does not allow less than four feet of separation when other states in fact do and suggested that reductions should also be allowed for new construction if IA technologies were used or pressure distribution or drip dispersal. And others in the group felt that the reduction should be allowed for new construction in general, not just with IA technologies. So let's take a look at where this requirement came from for the four or five foot separation. In 1991, there was a technical evaluation done for Title V. And the four feet of separation was required for pathogen removal. Research done at that time showed the World Health Organization was recommending a five log removal of pathogens for public health. And studies that were reviewed at that time um, showed that a four log removal of bacteria was demonstrated to occur by four feet of that unsaturated separation. And that greater than four log of bacterial removal could happen at five feet. The unknown then, and still now is what the virus removal is in those um, in that area. And there were a few studies that were available in 1991. And we have found that there are a few studies to this date. So in the next slide. In March of 2018, um, our third stakeholder group meeting the group agreed that pursuing a study on virus removal would be very beneficial. And it was like we had a crystal ball because we had no idea how beneficial uh, such a study would be um, now that we're actually approaching doing it. The study should examine both bacterial and viral removal at various depths with and without pressure distribution. So in 2019, Mass DEP worked with George Porifelder and Brian Baumgartel of the Massachusetts Alternative System Test Center and with Dr. Oscar Pancorbo of the Wall Experiment Station of DEP to develop the virus removal study. DEP was able to fund uh, 
through capital funds um, to allow the Mass Test Center to procure the equipment that they needed to do such a study. And the study itself will be funded under 319 grant funding. So let's take a look at what the study is going to evaluate. So the study is going to test for these pathogens, indigenous male specific and somatic phage viruses, fecal coliform, E. coli, and enterococcus. There are seven different treatments or vertical separations that are going to be examined. There will be four gravity supplied cells and the removal rates at two feet, three feet, four feet, and five feet for each of those organisms will be, will be sampled and tested. And there'll be three pressure dose scenarios of two feet, three feet, and four feet where the removal of those organisms will be tested. This is a large amount of sampling and a very large study. And so I'm going to ask Brian Baumgartel and George Hoyfelder to now share with us how um, the Mass Test Center has been getting ready to do this. And hopefully there's some great pictures of what's been going on at the site. So Brian and or George. Hi, Mary Beth, we're here. We're uh, here. Actually, our whole team is here uh, listening in. So great. Uh, if I can screen share, I think that would be the best way. Okay, uh, I can do that. Give me one moment. Sure. Let me just click online and I'll hit share. Whenever you are ready on your end. Yep, I think you're, I think you are ready. There we go. So um, Sorry, we're just going to start. Oh, sure. There we are. Okay, so George is going to start out with a description of the study detail and then we'll kind of go through uh, a bunch of pictures uh, to show you all the work that has been uh, done up to date. So George, take it away. Okay, as Mayor Beth mentioned, this, this actually followed up on some work we did years ago, uh, just before the adoption of Title V, in, and we used male-specific phage, and it was a very cursory study, but it supported the five-foot separation, four-foot separation uh, detail on Title V. But the new study is uh, expanded to include somatic phages, male-specific phages, and uh, through the efforts of Dr. Van Corbo, various animal or human viruses, which uh, will collect the samples here, keep them at minus 80, and send them up to the Wall Experimental Station. Uh, the bacteria decided, because some of them are generally the ones that are accepted in many studies, E. coli and Enercoccus for its persistence, and fecal coliform, which has been used historically. Uh, Mary Beth outlined exactly what's going on here, but we have on gravity feed, we'll have uh, two foot, three foot, four foot, and five foot. In discussion with Dr. Ben Corbo, we had originally decided possibly three replicates would be fine, but uh, if the data don't show stability, we'd be sort of up the creek at that point. So we have created five replicates and there will probably, we're still deciding whether there will be randomly three selected on each one or whether uh, during each sampling run or whether we'll select three randomly at first and stick with those three until we need the five replicates if the data do not show the required stability. Uh, in any case, all five replicates will receive wastewater from the entire study. Under pressure dosed, five replicates of each at two feet, three feet, and four feet. So the total number of replicates here is 35 replicates. The study site, each of the cells that contain the replicates uh, will have five foot uh, trenches, stone trenches in them. Uh, those trenches will be side by side. Each will be individually drained and each will have an individual sampling port. This is sort of a crude schemata of what goes on from the top and the side view. Next. The entire project takes up quite a bit of um, the test site here. And as you can see, uh, we tried to position everything so that 
we have the minimum runs for the supply line and the minimum runs for the collection points where we'll be receiving the uh, samples. About two liters of samples are required each time we go out there. The wastewater is uh, residential wastewater from the uh, base here as well as uh, county jail, residential housing from the Coast Guard housing. We do understand that at some point we might have to spike the samples for some of the phage viruses that we're looking at, but we're now looking at some of the initial values we're getting from the raw wastewater to see whether we'll have to do that. Because remember, what we're targeting here is a five log removal. And uh, so in order to show a five log removal, we probably have to have five or six log uh, tighter going into the system. Next. So uh, the replicate cells for gravity from two to five feet, that's, uh, will have its, its own uh, trench, one by one trench or under gravity distribution, each cell uh, under Dr. Pink Corbo's sort of guidance should have a flush port for the underdrain because of uh, the possibility of aftergrowth and regrowth of the organisms. So this shows the gravity. Next one will show the pressure dosed. And we threw this out to the committee, how many sort of pressure dosed orifices we needed in each of the cells. And I think the number decided upon was three. Uh, again, this is much like the gravity cell, it go from two to four feet. So I'm gonna let uh, somebody else take over the viral analysis piece. This, this is our, our roadmap. Uh, so look carefully at that and memorize it. There is a test at the end. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. so... Um... So the virus analysis itself, it's uh, EPA 1643, um, which involves uh, ultrafiltration step, which is to concentrate the virus to get it to a point where we can hopefully be able to uh, detect it in the treated wastewater samples. We won't be doing that for the incoming wastewater, our raw wastewater influent, because there's typically enough virus load there for us to work with. Um, sort of the, the next um, step, and I'm really shortcutting a lot of the, the actual individual steps that go with this because there's a lot of, you know, incubating colonies and getting um, two different um, E. coli strains to, to grow and uh, multiplying viral strains in order to do spikes and um, some of our controls. Um, so uh, basically we do the ultrafiltration piece, take the... Um, Get the term for the the um, condense it or the, the right right um, the permeate from the um, from the ultra filters and put those uh, mix those with um, some antibiotic that is to kill off anything that's not the E. coli that we want. Uh, we inoculate those uh, samples with the virus that we're interested in, and then those all get plated and incubated. And each of the two um, species of virus require five plates each. Um, so we're doing somatic and MS2 phages. So we're talking 10 plates per sample and each sample, each cell gets a sample. So on a typical day of sampling for this, we're looking at about 80 plates or so that we'll be processing. Um, so we're gonna have some pretty Pretty heavy days, probably a Tuesday is going to be the day where we all sort of, uh, you know, we're all on deck for that that day. Um, and then the other piece of this is to do the bacterial analysis, which is being done by, oh, here's a couple pieces of equipment, sorry. So on the bottom there, that's the uh, ultrafiltration device, which is actually uh, made for uh, dialysis. Uh, and a couple just general pictures, water bath up there. Um, and then over on the right are the colony counters we'll be using uh, for the virus piece. And then for the bacterial analysis, we're using what's called the Quantitrace system by IDEX. Uh, in the past, it was generally done by membrane filtration, which is a, anybody who's done it knows that it's a long process. And when you're trying to do a lot of samples, it takes a lot of time. The Quantitrace system is great because it's, it's based on the multi-well 
uh, multi, uh, multi well most probable number method in standard methods. Um, and basically it's a, it's a tray with a number of small wells. You pour in the sample and the reagents, you seal them in that white sealer over here. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse cursor. Um, put them through the sealer, incubate them for 18 hours, and then you're able to count the number of cells that change color, and that gives you the most probable number for the, uh, the number of colonies or CFUs that would be in that sample. So it's a nice quick way of doing it. Um, and given the fact that the virus analysis itself is so in depth, um, you know, being able to do the bacterial piece um, as quickly as possible will definitely be very helpful. Um, so I'm just gonna start with test cell construction. So uh, this was about a month ago, or I would yeah. say when we first had the excavators out here, um, they brought like the monster machine out here. So they dug the hole really quick, but there was some very careful maneuvering under the power lines that you see there. <laughs> so um, they were able to get the two deepest um, test cells installed and the sample collection tank on the first um, the first day. So here are a few of the shims coming in, brought in site. Uh, these were done by Wigan Precast, which is a company here on Cape Cod. Uh, the installing company was um, Robert oh, yeah. Auer, uh, Bobby Auer, Robert Auer. Um, so they came in and set the tanks for us. So you can see uh, over on the right is the five foot deep cell. The, over on the left is the four foot deep. And then in the center is that uh, collection chamber that you saw um, in Georgia's diagrams. So we had to figure out a good way to divide, you know, divide this up using the liner. So George came up with this really cool system of um, constructing these sort of wood forms that we can uh, wrap the liners around uh, to be able to fill these cells up because we have to do them uh, evenly as we go along because if we, you know, we can't just build one and fill it because it'll spill over into the next one. So we have to do them all evenly. So we set them, set them all up, put the under drains in and you can see that over on the left is an example of one of the under drains. Um, you can actually see the sandpipe there at the top of that picture, which is the clean out pipe, and then the discharge would be toward the bottom of that picture. Um, so then we put the uh, P stone in the bottom to provide, um, you know, quick exit for the treated wastewater, as well as provide a level uh, to start on, because the bottom of all of these bags such that the wastewater flows towards it uh, to get a uh, very efficient discharge from into the test cells. Um, so then you can see we start filling them up with sand. This is very much a manual type of process. We have a backhoe here, but there's still a whole lot of shoveling that goes with this. Um, you know, we're doing probably about a four inch rise, I would say. Um, and then we're leveling and compacting with each, uh, each step. And obviously you can't fit a compactor in there. So we're doing it all with uh, that we have attached to our legs. So a lot of walking, a lot of shoveling, and uh, a lot of moving of materials uh, around the site to get these test cells installed. Um, as we do the sand, we bring up those wood forms until they get to a height that the bag sort of self-support, and then we'll top them off. Um, right now, we left them with just the sand at the appropriate depths, and then we'll go back um, once all the test cells are installed and do the, the trenches um, on top of them all. I won't have obviously pictures of that piece. Um, so just a couple days ago, we had the next set of three cells installed. You can see them over there on the left in that uh, left hand picture. So we had two of the three foot cells installed and the second four foot cell installed. Um, and you can see the wood covers that we put over top of the existing ones to protect them from any uh, dirt or anything getting in as we were putting the other three in. Um, the center picture there is just a, a quick shot of the um, sampling chamber. So it's, it's filled with muddy water right now because we um, rinsed down all of the um, pea stone after we put it into the test cell. So all that sort of dirty water has been collecting in our chamber. We'll clean that all out um, before we actually start the sampling process. And then over on the right is just a quick shot of one of the sampling risers that we'll be using for the test cells that don't feed into the big um, concrete chamber um, in the middle there. 
So is there anything you want to cover before I go? No, it's, uh, it's important to remember that each of the cells drains individually. So uh, we really have to keep those segregated enough to take a two liter sample every time. And you can't see where in between that, uh, the wood top box there on the uh, left hand picture, and the other will sit the trailer, which I think we'll talk about next, but that's where the feed trailer will be for all of those cells that are surrounding it. So, you no, know, that's about it. Okay. Yeah, so we uh, had originally planned on actually building some sheds uh, over there or some, you know, small buildings to be able to house the dosing mechanisms because we've got to be able to dose these all um, perfectly even. So we actually had decided to do individual dosing um, barrels for each test cell. So we have 35 individual barrels for each one. Uh, so these barrels are set up with uh, an overflow weir so they precisely um, measure out an amount of incoming wastewater that then gets sent out to the cell. Um, for the gravity feed cells, there it will be a, uh, a drain at the bottom of the bucket that is controlled by uh, an electronic uh, ball valve, um, similar to the ones you see over on the, the right-hand picture. The blue boxes are the electronic ball valves. Um, and the gravity feed ones will have an individual um, pump inside the bucket that will pump out to the pressure dose leach fields. And the pumps that we got are what are called skimmer pumps. So they're able to draw down to like about an eighth of an inch or something like that. Um, so we'll be able to provide, you know, very accurate gravity fed wastewater to the gravity fields and very accurate pressure fed um, wastewater to the pressure uh, distribution fields. Um, the manifold that you see over there on the right in that right hand picture is actually to um, uh, divide the incoming wastewater up into into the five blocks or the, the seven individual blocks of five buckets that go with the five cells. So um, we couldn't fill all the buckets at once because it's just practically impossible. So we solenoid off each of those sections um, and it gives us, you know, a little bit more control over when things get dosed and, and so forth. Um, each of the buckets will have a float in it uh, to make sure that each of the cells got the proper number of doses per day. Um, so we'll be able to maintain very precise control over, precise control over the amount of wastewater that each of the test cells get. Um, and we actually are housing all this inside of uh, what was a, a Red Cross trailer that was used um, down south, there are emergency housing trailers. I don't, I don't know if this one was used for Hurricane Katrina, but they yeah. use similar units for Katrina. Um, so, you know, we recycle as much up here as we can at the test center. Anybody who's been here knows that that's where we're like scroungers and recyclers here. So, um, you know, we decided to reuse this, uh, this build, this uh, trailer to uh, save a little bit of uh, money rather than build um, sheds or any small outbuildings. Um, so laboratory construction. Um, so as we were putting the study together um, in conjunction with Dr. Pancorbo, um, you know, there were a few issues with being able to do the virus study at the DEP lab. One of those being space and personnel requirements, um, and the other being um, just hold times. So these samples don't have very long hold times before they need to be processed. Um, so rather than bring them up to the DEP lab and potentially um, violate or get a little too tight on hold times, it was decided that we would construct a facility actually up here at the test center that would house the laboratory equipment um, needed to do all of that virus analysis. So um, these are just a few pictures of that building being um, transported out here and installed. Um, so the top couple are the deck that we built, you can see on the bottom left, it was actually came in two pieces and this company just came in and kind of jimmied it into a really tight spot. So that was kind of fun for us to watch. And over on the right um, is a trench. And I put this here just so you understand the amount of work that we put into this. Um, so that's the trench housing the electrical connection for this. And that trench was well over a hundred feet long and probably a third of it we had to hand dig. Um, through very hard soil. So uh, George and I spent 
boy, it must have been at least three days yeah. digging that section. Uh, that was that was misery. I don't want to dig dig a <laughs> trench like that by hand ever again. I'm I'm good on that. Um, so um, and then we had an electrician obviously come in and do the the electrical wiring for that piece. Um, so here's just a couple of construction pictures. The building was just empty when we started out. Um, so we built a few walls uh, to house a bottle room and some storage area over there on the left. And on the right, you can see the cabinetry pieces uh, under construction. Uh, we actually went to the Habitat for Humanity Restore down here on the Cape to, to purchase the cabinets. So it was a good cost savings and the money ended up going to a good cause. So it was a sort of win-win there. Um, the countertops themselves are all um, you know, laboratory countertops. So we installed the fume hood, um, all the um, you know, plumbing and everything. We had to put together a water filtration system because we need reagent grade water out here and we need quite a bit of it. So um, we actually installed a water filtration system for this. Um, so you can see a lot of that over on the left and over on the right is the bottle washing and autoclaving room. Uh, so, yeah, I thought I had a couple pictures of the actual laboratory equipment in that, but I thought I must have moved them uh, when I sort of rearranged a couple. So, so yeah, so there's the equipment sitting on the, the benches and everything. Um, so right now, I mean, the lab itself is, is just about ready to be able to run some samples some issues with procurement um, as we've gone through this and as everybody COVID supply chains disrupted all over the place so we've had some, some delays in procuring equipment and chemicals um, we've had an issue with an ultra cold freezer so we have to store samples um, in our cultures at minus 80 degrees celsius uh, so that of course requires a pretty expensive um, <laughs> freezer uh, to be able to do that and we've had some issues with that freezer um, but we're, you know, on the cusp of being able to start to run some of our preliminary virus samples um, to get a sense of where our incoming wastewater is at. Um, we'll do some sort of mini studies to look at perhaps if there are any diurnal patterns or anything like that in the incoming wastewater. Um, plus, we're just scientifically curious people, so, you know, we can't help but sort of mess around <laughs> with some of this stuff as we're getting the test cells uh, um, so you saw in the test cell pictures, we've got two of them filled with sand at this point. We've got another three of them out there waiting for us this afternoon to work on them. Um, and then there's an additional two that'll be coming in in about two weeks. Um, again, with COVID and some of the uh, personnel challenges we've had at the test center this year, um, you know, a lot of the work uh, as far as the actual internal construction has fallen on George and I and my staff is kicked in with a shovel where they've been able to uh, to help us out and get this done. But it's been uh, it's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and we're really looking forward to finishing up the test cells, finishing up the dosing trailer. And um, you know, we're hopeful that we'll start running our first samples toward, um, you know, probably the beginning of uh, November or so is where we're, we're sort of at right now. And George, if there's anything you'd like to to that. Sure. Prior to running any for this exact study, we have a number of trenches here that have been installed in the past. So we can get our feet wet. Possibly a bad analogy there, but we can <laughs> we can get at least samples from systems that will be very similar to what this study is all about. We also have some other folks doing some work here, for instance, with drip so that we could take a few samples there to understand what's going on in those systems. All of these will be sort of priming us for all our quality assurance plans. If anybody has written a quality assurance plan, a project plan for a project this size, you understand that's gonna be a while. So we have to prove our proficiency before we engage in this part of the study. So we look forward to doing that because uh, it's, we believe it's going to be a very valuable piece of information for, for DEP and the industry and the, the folks in Massachusetts as well as the rest of the country. That's all we have. Why don't we take any questions? So I'll just sort of introduce the rest of our team. Um, Kathy Regan is our
microbiologist. She's going to be the one in the lab running all these samples. Um, she's been here for uh, a month and a half or so, kind of, you know, getting her head around the method and getting things set up in the laboratory. Um, we have Tracy Long here who has helped us tremendously in procuring all this stuff. She's our administrative assistant. She's uh, the one paying all the bills for us and, you know, making sure we get the liner when we need it. Um, and Emily Michelle Olmsted is uh, here as well. She's helping us with uh, quality assurance and, um, you know, she'll be also assisting in the laboratory. So, um, and we'll also be bringing on a new operator out here in the next few days um, who we're excited to have join us. Um, he should be able to really contribute to this project, you know, and throw his back behind helping us construct these cells, get this, this piece of the project finished, and then we can start the sampling. So, um, the folks, the folks who are involved here are, and we really would like to appreciate it, the folks from EPA, because mm -hmm. the EPA folks in Cincinnati are the ones who developed this method, uh, and they have been more than willing to help us out. We actually sent Emily and Michelle out there to take copious notes to sort of be shepherded by the people who actually wrote the method and uh, they continue to supply us. We have, uh, we're short one particular chemical which we can't get right now because of a supply chain uh, interruption and they have offered to send us some for our use. So we really hope to hit the ground running and get this thing going. Great, thank you, George. And I think uh, Dr. Oscar Pancorbo has joined us by phone. Oh, um, great, yeah, Oscar. No, Oscar, if you wanted to say hi to the group. Oh, just me. <laughs> <You're not. laughs> Sorry, he was listening. Um, Oscar has been uh, very big in uh, assisting us in developing the scope. We are finalizing the scope. And as you saw, they're constructing and getting ready to begin the study. Um, the study is set once it's started to run for one year. Um, so we look to get one year of the samples. And I had, um, the opportunity to go to the Mass Test Center on uh, Monday, along with my colleague, Hirsch Takor, who's also joined us on the call today. Um, and it's impressive. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very impressive. Um, it's uh, quite a masterminded puzzle that George and Brian have put together. The laboratory is looking fantastic. And uh, so it's all very exciting, but it's a it's a tremendous amount of sampling and um, very impressive indeed. So with that, we do have some questions that came in. Um, and again, if you can put them into the chat, um, I'll just call on you and uh, you can unmute and ask your question so that everyone can hear it. Um, so Larry, you had asked about uh, if we could speak to loading rates. Larry still with us? Can you unmute Larry? There, okay. Now you can hear me. There we go. Now we can hear uh, you, yeah. Okay. Um, my my internet that's a little slow to respond. Um, uh, just a thought and uh, if you could uh, explain the loading rates uh, uh, and how you chose those and uh, perhaps uh, uh, what they what they are, or do you plan to change those over the course of the study? Um, because it seems to me that with given the same kind of um, media material in the in the test reactors, you may get different results with different loading rates. Yes, great question, Larry. I think our, our initial part, of course, as part of the study was because of the inquiry under the governor's order there. We're starting with the loading rates at level five for that particular sand, which are 0.74 gallons per square foot per day. Now, the consideration there is that in Massachusetts, the sidewall area on a trench is used as well as the basal area and the ends. 
So we will start off with that loading rate. And I'm sure as the study progresses and ends up in its first year, and depending on what the results are, there may be an appetite to sort of modify those loading rates. Uh, but right now we're applying them at the Massachusetts rate for that particular soil. Uh, and that's 0.74 gallons per square foot per day, which by the way, coincidentally, years ago when we did the work, uh, a grant with this MS2, we found that at 0.75 gallons per square foot per day, very close to our loading rate, because I did the work right before Title V change, we saw the five log removal, which sort of substantiated the five foot separation. But what we're excited about here is the pressure dosing, which was actually a recommendation under the Fay Weight Report in 78. Uh, we're going to see what impact that has at the 0.74 gallons per square foot per day. But after this is done, I mean, after the one year, we could do anything from altering the water table, which we can inside of these cells, to increase the loading rate, to uh, the impact of time dosing versus just regular uh, pressure dosing. Uh, so there's a number of things that could be done here for uh, the various contaminants as opposed to just the pathogen surrogate, surrogates that we're using. Yeah, and I would just add that we, we've really constructed a, a, a multi, what will end up being a multi-purpose infrastructure for this project. So we sort of put it together with that thought in mind that we could, you know, build it so we could easily make those changes in the future to be able to, to, to uh, look at some of the other questions that might come up. So, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic infrastructure that we've been able to put together for this project mm -hmm. and it'll have years of use and uh, uh, answering of questions. So. Thank you, DEP. So initially, the the uh, time dosing, or excuse me, time dosing will not be used with pressure distribution. It'll just be uh, displacement dosing. And it, will simulate, it will simulate demand dosing, yes. So what uh, pattern would that be throughout the day? The pattern we'll use is one that's accepted by NSF, which is, I believe, uh, the 35, 25, 40 uh, for the three main dosing periods during the day. And since that's one that's accepted, we're open to using anything. And as Brian said, uh, the controller that's being designed will have the flexibility to do anything we want. But that would seem like since NSF considers that a uh, usual dosing pattern for residential housing, a residential home, you know, you get up in the morning, you use about 35% during the midday, there's not as much usage. And then at night, the 40% when everybody comes home and takes a shower. But uh, uh, not to be argumentative, but uh, that that's not the way pressure dosing, displacement dosing will actually function in the real world. Uh, because there will be water stored in the tank and that over the surface area of a of a tank, depending on the configuration, it's likely to accumulate uh, between doses uh, anywhere from uh, 40 to to 100 gallons, and then the pump kicks on and floods the field with uh, that amount of water. So it it it's it seems to me to fall short a little bit without using a time dosing uh, falls short of a, uh, a pressure dosing comparison. Well, Larry, you know, I think if you would put that down as far as how we would dose that, uh, we can accommodate just about anything you think will better simulate. Uh, but in the Commonwealth, here, right now, under our code, the uh, pump chamber operates fairly similarly to what you said, except there is a minimum dose volume, uh, which is related to the volume of the pipe that is dosed each, each cycle. So uh, I know in the field that many people set them to dose like one third or one half of the 
ghost going to the house. So they set those floats real wide and they really pulse out to the system. But uh, for our initial work here, we decided to use the, the NSF dosing sort of scheme. But if uh, you prevail upon the group to do it any other way, we'd be glad to accommodate it because we do have the flexibility to do that. Yeah, I wonder. Okay. And I think, Larry, if I may, in the interest of time, because we do have some other questions, I think what you're delving into warrants maybe a, a further discussion. Um, so if you could um, send um, your comments, um, you know, and your questions concerning the pressure dosing, and then we can probably arrange a time to talk with George and Brian and, and anyone else who wants to join that conversation. Um, okay, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, so Jeff Bram, uh, well, uh, Jeff had numerous questions and he had mentioned that. So I'll let Jem Jeff go. And then, uh, Dave Young also, um, had another question. So Jeff, if you can unmute. Yep, I did. Can you everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, I have, I think five questions written down. I think you answered the first one, uh, George. What is the base soil used? So you indicated 0.74, which is a sand soil. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Is it just on-site soils or did you truck them in? No, these were, uh, since we had to get everything specified the same, we had to make the same, uh, we used what would meet the Title V fill criteria. Uh, so we used Title V fill criteria, which is pretty much ASTM 633 sand, which meets that criteria, although not all Title V fill meets the ASTM 633 criteria. So in order to make it all the same, we bought one large lot, 140 ton of sand, so that we could fill all those cells that all be the same, compacted the same, and have the same sand. First of all, on response, the, the study is unbelievably impressive. I agree with Mary Beth. What I've seen just with the slides and what you've described, um, awesome. The, I'm going to be a little bit like Larry, I guess. The real life scenario is that uh, Title V sand is more rare than common, almost very, very rare. So are we looking at any other types of soils like a, a loamy sand or something that doesn't have such a fast infiltration rate? Well, I believe that the, the, the first goal was to give the worst possible case, which is somebody who is, has a system. I mean, the comments were, for instance, about mounding, and you use Title V sand for that. Uh, and mounds are, are used to sort of get at the whole water table issue. So we would, of course, be welcome to to try all sorts of different soils, but the first place to start would be that which was required in the code for fill. So that's what the, the first part of this study is, which will run, as I said, or as you've heard for a year. Okay, and, and I think, I guess I'd be an advocate of continuing the study for different soils, uh, depending on what the results are, obviously. So Amen. let's move on. Um, I just have curiosity because I've been so interested in this is my one of my comments or the home builders comments so I'm thrilled that you're taking it up and um, obviously doing this we've always believed in a science based approach. This is a, absolutely that so we're thrilled with that. So just some background so I could tell uh, my people uh, when I have our, our next zoom meeting. What was, can you tell me the total capital cost and the total study cost and how was it funded. I think Mary Beth could do a little bit better job at that, uh, but uh, so it's coming from 319 funding, which is a non-point source pollution competitive grant program. So Mary Beth, you probably have a better idea of the numbers. Yeah, so I have a better idea of the capital cost numbers. Um, I apologize, I didn't go back to the 319 grant cost, but the capital funding was um, for the equipment um, that was needed, and that was a total of $195,000. And we were able to secure that for fiscal year 20. So in July of 
um, 2019, we were able to have those funds available. And um, that's when that was authorized. And simultaneously, the 319 grant was authorized. And was that 200,000? I'd be guessing, George O'Brien. Yeah, that was close because we hired microbiologists for a year. The construction that you see there, the total construction cost, I think, was somewhere around $65,000. Uh, and uh, there's a match, which is, of course, the time that we've been putting into it and will continue to put into it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be uh, outlined at all, Mary Beth, in some kind of, or is it in the report, or will, will we be getting some kind of report on that? Yes, so we do have a scope of work um, that we are finalizing with the details um, of how the study, how the cells are set up. Uh, a lot of the diagrams that George showed will be in that scope. And once that is finalized, that'll be posted and the group will be notified that it's been posted and given the web link for where that will be. And awesome. then, yes, there'll be, once the study is complete, which as you said, from start to finish, it'll run for a year for the purposes of this comment and evaluation of this comment. Um, and then, um, you know, there'll be time for analyzing the data and, um, George can speak better to how long it takes to put one of those reports together, having done this um, somewhat previously earlier. Yeah, I would say that uh, following all data collection in a, in a year, uh, that the month, it would be about three months before a final report comes out. However, we will probably be uh, having data reports because 319 requires quarterly data reports. Uh, so you'll be able to see as we go uh, the progress we're making. Great. At the end of it, will it be published? I believe that this is like ripe for a lot of publications. Right, right. Uh, I'm sure other states and the EPA and others will be, you know, various universities will be thrilled with it, depending on what comes out of it. That's great. Well, the goal is to have it peer reviewed and, and be published. Great. Maybe you'll win an award. Uh, can any of us visit the site, Mary Beth? Is, it, is there a scheduled time for us to all maybe do it on a certain day or can we do individually? I think um, Brian and George are probably open to that, but you do have to bring a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> and a bat. And some gloves. <laughs> that's an awesome, awesome answer. Um, yep. Yes, I think if people in the group, and Brian and George, correct me if I'm wrong, but they are always very welcoming at the Mass Test Center and very happy to show their work there, um, which is a lot of hard work and also very creative work. So. Um, if that is something people are interested in, I'm happy to coordinate that if Brian and George are okay with that. Sure, that'd be great. Absolutely. The more the merrier. I we may have to go in groups of less than 10. You know, we are going to have to maintain protocols and such, but we can, we can get that coordinated. So just send me an email if that is something you are interested in doing, um, and we can work on setting up a time to do that. And depending on the number of people, maybe a couple of visits. So. And then bring our shovels. Awesome. That's right. You got to bring your shovels. That's right. All and right. Shovels and, shovels and beakers. That's all my questions. Thank you so much. I'm You're very welcome. impressed. And I'm, uh, as you've done with others, you've done a great job, uh, DP, in putting forth uh, uh, the right answers to the questions. So thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for your questions. Um, Dave Young, you had a question. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Hey, Beth, this is Lelden. Shall we, shall we go to where everyone can see one another? I can stop the screen sharing at this point. Sure. Okay, let me do that, and then I'll get that, that one more question. There you go. Hey. 
Hello, everyone. <laughs> if you're snoozing, wake up, because we can see you now. <laughs> OK, is Dave, Dave Yeah, to save time, I'll, I'll start okay. my question um, while Weldon's doing that. Uh, this is a great study. I'm, I'm excited that it's going on, and you clearly have the right people involved in doing it, so that's wonderful. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, this is related to Title V. Um, George, I, I can only hope at some point you get to do it on the uh, uh, carbon layered septic system as well. Uh, but I was wondering whether the results uh, will be considered for the groundwater discharge permit uh, four foot separation criteria as well. And if so, uh, that's quite a bit different uh, quality of effluent being applied. So I was just wondering whether that was being considered as part of this. So I would say the con so the study was designed based on the comment that we, we received, um, which was specific to Title V. So in the development of the study, we weren't looking at groundwater discharges and potentially changing them. But I think, you know, it's something we can keep you know, in the back of our minds and when we get results to see if there are things that apply. But you no, know, it wasn't an original consideration. Okay, are there any other questions from anyone? So I would like to thank George and Brian and Emily, Michelle and Tracy and Kathy. Um, thank you all so much for joining us and for your hard work. And you're supposed to include pictures of you guys shoveling, just so you know, for your next presentation. All right. All right. <laughs> so, so people know. Hey, Mary Beth. Yes. Mary Beth, this is Oscar. Hi, Oscar. I'm oh, sorry, I had trouble unmuting. Uh, earlier. Um, just wanted to let you know I've, I've been listening in. Um, I did want to add for the for the benefit of the group that uh, we hope to also monitor um, human enteric viruses in um, during this study in both uh, the raw uh, sewage as well as in the in the leachate samples. Um, this will be all be done by PCR, specifically by RT-PCR, um, um, because we'll, we'll be looking both at DNA and RNA viruses. Um, we'll also monitor uh, the pepper mild model virus. Um, this is the most prevalent uh, RNA virus in, um, in human feces, and uh, also the cross phage, which is a, another virus that's are uh, very prevalent in, in raw sewage uh, at levels much higher than, than the quality pages. Um, that, this will all be done by PCR, so not culture. Um, one of the questions that's concerned is, how do we know that the viruses, uh, the RNA that you're detecting for a particular virus in leachate is in fact uh, an intact virus as opposed to just the nucleic acid? Um, well, many of these are RNA viruses. RNA and, and as for that matter, DNA, uh, uh, when it's not coated with the viral protein, it just doesn't persist very well. It degrades very quickly in sewage and in a, a soil environment uh, even more so. Um, so the likelihood that we would detect uh, the nucleic acid of a, uh, a, you know, a virus that's not coated in leachate um, it's very, very unlikely, but this will give us sort of the worst case scenario to see if any of the, especially human enteric viruses are breaking through into, into leachate. Um, ultimately, they're the ones we're more concerned about than, um, than phage per se. Um, I just want to let the group know that we're also hoping to do this. Um, and uh, it'll be done by digital droplet PCR which is an extremely sensitive, exquisitely sensitive method for, um, for PCR detection. It does not require calibration. Uh, 
it um, it's a, a very uh, sensitive quantitation method. Um, so we hope to have some additional data to to go along the with the uh, polyphage data that uh, that George and Brian are are, are um, developing. That's great. Thank you, Oscar. Um, so if no one has any further questions, this is the link I will send out to the group. You know, my screen. Um, this is where the presentations, um, the PowerPoint for this meeting, the presentation by UMass, the report by UMass, eventually the scope for the virus removal study that we've been speaking to, all the documentation um, will be at this. And, and once we start putting uh, documents out there, I will email this link out to the group um, for your use. And we also, the, the call was recorded as we let everyone know at the beginning. Um, and we can share that recording, the link for that recording as well. So Beth, that, think we also have a question from Dan Ottenheimer. I lost my chat box, so. Thank you, Leldon, Mary Beth, good morning. I really just wanted to thank everybody. Um, as you know, um, you're representing the Yankee Onsite Wastewater Association and our whole mission is to advance the science and the regulations and implementation of onsite wastewater regulations. And the department has committed a lot of time and financial resources into this study group and uh, just wanted to thank you. Thank you, Dan. We appreciate your participation. Thanks, Dan. And we are exactly on time. <laughs> so we are good. We are good. Everybody pat themselves on the back. Well done. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone who presented. Thanks everyone for participating in the stakeholder group. Thanks for your interest and um, send me an email if you have a shovel and you want to go to the test center. Thank you all. Thank have you a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.